May Jesus and Mary be loved by all hearts. In this presentation, I'll call for you all the quotations that I've found in Mary's apparitions or her alleged apparitions regarding the Second Vatican Council. I'm not going to digress on any extensive discussion of the status of approval on those apparitions, which are presently being evaluated by theologians. Suffice it to say that I would not cite for you here texts from any apparitions that have been rejected by the church. About two decades before Vatican II, Our Lady of All Nations began speaking a great deal about the matters that would be dealt with in the council to a Dutch factory worker who lived in Amsterdam. I'll cluster those quotations at the end of this presentation because there are so many. I want to begin by making an observation common to all the modern Marian apparitions. The Queen of Heaven systematically neglected the proper language of the church, namely Latin, and spoke to the seers in their native dialects. When she solemnly announced to St. Bernadette that she was the Immaculate Conception, it would have surely impressed the clergy that Bernadette would have stammered out the phrase in Latin. Instead, Our Lady didn't even say it in French a language that Bernadette had not yet learned. The humble girl of Nazareth, Our Lady, uttered the sublime words in the Pyrenean dialect, which was more Spanish than French, and which the humble people of Lourdes could grasp. At La Salette, Our Lady delivered part of her message in the local dialect, which was a mixture of Italian and French, but she dictated her scathing secret in French only because it was meant for the upper class. Let's go to Ireland, Our Lady of Knock. The Blessed Virgin appears in a still life tableau before 18 parishioners. In this apparition, she is not front and center. It is the altar and lamb who command the center place as in a mass. St. John appeared to be giving a homily. St. Joseph and Our Lady and many angels are in attendance. What right is the mass? The altar is wooden, like a table. The people were rather surprised that St. John the Apostle wore a small mitre. They were accustomed to seeing the bishops wearing towering mitres encrusted with jewels to suggest royal dominion. With Vatican II, Pope Paul VI laid aside his tiara and introduced shorter and simpler mitres. There were many reasons for that, of course, but one of them was to reduce the gap between the man at the altar and the man in the pew. Vatican II was very much about affirming the holiness of the baptismal vocation as willed by God and important for the church. It had been debated for centuries whether the laity or only consecrated priests and religious were called to the heights of sanctity. The Constitution Lumen Gentium stated boldly and clearly, all the faithful, whatever their condition or state, are called by the Lord each in his own way to that perfect holiness, whereby the Father himself is perfect. Mary and Joseph, standing with St. John, were themselves lay people, and this is an apparition par excellence for lay people. So now we travel to Fatima. The angel of Fatima gave Holy Communion under both species to the children. Lucia related this incident in these words. The angel rose, took in his hand the chalice and the host. The host he gave to me, and the contents of the chalice he divided between Jacinta and Francisco, saying at the same time, eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, terribly outraged by the ingratitude of men. Offer reparation for their sakes and console God. Only a few years earlier, Pope St. Pius X had done a rather novel thing by mandating that the age for First Communion be lowered to children who had reached the age of reason, instead of having them wait until they were 12 or 13. Little Jacinta and Francisco had not yet received their first communion, so the angel was affirming the decision of the Pope by administering to them the Holy Eucharist. However, the custom was still resisted in many villages out of concern for sufficient reverence for the sacrament. Francisco would not receive his whole official first communion until shortly before he died a few months shy of his 11th birthday. Not only was the angel affirming the novel but fully implemented practice of it 
not fully implemented practice of admitting rather young children to Holy Communion, he was affirming the future decision of the novel practice of admitting lay persons to the chalice. Of course, neither practice was really novel. Both had been the custom in the early church, but laid aside out of human and understandable concern for sufficient reverence for the Blessed Sacrament. But we easily forget that Jesus criticized the devout and highly respected Pharisees for their pious practices when, to ensure reverence, they enforce many man-made precepts, such as the washing of hands and vessels. Now let us go to Hungary to quote from the Flame of Love messages given to Elizabeth Kindleman. These messages have acquired the highest level of approval possible for private revelations and are becoming known all over the world. October 25th, 1964, Jesus said, quote, After Satan will have them blinded, the decrees of the council will be accomplished in extraordinarily great measure. Now that term blinded refers to the flame of love prayers which had a promise to blind Satan. And then after the council, this was in 1964, so the council was still in session. And he says, um, the decrees will be accomplished in an extraordinarily great measure. Now a few months later, on New, New Year's Day, 1965, the Blessed Virgin said, by the effusion of my flame of love, I will crown with success the Holy Council, end quote. New Year's Day would soon become a Marian feast. The council had opened on the feast of the Mother of God, October 11, 1962, which had begun to be celebrated universally by the entire Catholic Church, thanks to a decree of Pope Pius XI only in 1931. So after the council, the new liturgical calendar raised the rank of this feast and placed it at the crowning day of the octave of the Incarnation, the eighth day of Christmas. Pope St. Paul VI explained in Marialis Cultus, quote, this celebration placed on January 1st is meant to commemorate the part played by Mary in this mystery of salvation. It is meant also to exalt the singular dignity which this mystery brings to the Holy Mother, through whom we were found worthy to receive the author of life. Now on this subject of the Theotokos, let's move over to Spain. This same Pope, Paul VI, worked harder than any pontiff in recent centuries to heal the schism of the East and West. Many saints have prophesied that the age is coming soon when Christians will be united as Jesus prayed at the Last Supper. And we can assume that this is part of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. So I find it significant that several times in their ecstasies, the seers of Garabandal pronounced words and phrases and languages completely unknown to them. In Conchita's diary, Father Ramon Maria Andrews' statement is given, the girls have certainly spoken more than once in foreign languages. I myself heard, of the, heard one of them recite the Hail Mary in Greek. Was not this the language in which the greeting of the angel Gabriel and Saint Elizabeth were originally recorded by Saint Luke? The church's liturgies were mostly in Greek in the year 431, when the bishops met in council at Ephesus to assert the divinity of Jesus Christ and that Mary was the Theotokos, the mother of God. The Greek language uttered by the girls at Garabandal was surely a sign to remind Christians to work towards community of, communion of faith and love. Let us pray that it was a sign of a great reunion to come. Garabandal is on everyone's radar right now because of the prophesied warning, illumination of conscience, which seems to be drawing near. But here, I would like to quote what is probably the most explicit and powerful Marian endorsement of the Second Vatican Council. I'm taking it from the highly respectable work, the English translation, by the Capuchin priest Garcia de Besquera, OFM. It's titled, She Went in Haste to the Mountain. This is on page 436. Um, it says, one day Conchita was having an apparition of the Blessed Virgin, and this is what the people heard her say, which was the one side of the dialogue. Conchita asks, so the council, it is the greatest of all? Will it be a success? Oh, that's good. That way they will know you better, and you will be very happy. 
Vera Boundal is very much an icon of the council. The council began when the church was strong and large, and then it underwent a lot of self-doubt and external criticism. And then, under St. John Paul II, it became strong again. The apparitions at Garabandal begin with the enthusiasm of the whole village, drawing in thousands of spectators. But then, as Our Lady predicted, the girls would be tested with self-doubt. Three of the four girls and most of the whole village eventually regained their strength and certainty. The first public message of Garabando, which the girls were told to proclaim one year before the Second Vatican Council convened, it, would, it could be construed as an admonition to the council fathers to focus on the essentials of conversion. It was given October 18, 1861. We must make many sacrifices perform much penance, and visit the Blessed Sacrament frequently. But first, we must lead good lives. If we do not, a chastisement will befall us. The cup is already filling up. If we do not change, a very great chastisement will come upon us. Then the final public message was given six months before the closing of Vatican II and could be construed as a warning to the Church that if the Council documents were implemented in a bad spirit, the result would be the loss of salvation for many. This was given June 18, 1965. As my message of October 18 has not been complied with and has not been made known to the world, I am advising you that this is the last one. Before, the cup was filling up. Now, it is flowing over. Many cardinals, many bishops, and many priests are on the road to perdition and are taking many souls with them. Less and less importance is being given to the Eucharist. You should turn the wrath of God away from yourselves by your efforts. If you ask his forgiveness with sincere hearts, he will pardon you. I, your mother, through the intercession of St. Michael the Archangel, ask you to amend your lives. You are now receiving the last warnings. I love you very much and do not want your condemnation. Pray to us with sincerity, and we will grant your requests. You should make more sacrifices. Think about the passion of Jesus. So pay attention. Before the council started, when the liturgies were in Latin and vocations were numerous, Mary was complaining in her first message about much sin. The cup, she said, was filling up. In other words, it was a lot of showiness of holiness, but inside was superficial reverence and grave sin. This is basically a collective hypocrisy of which Jesus was always accusing the Pharisees. You Pharisees, cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of extortion and wickedness. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and salva salutations in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like graves which are not seen, and men walk over them without knowing it. That was from Luke chapter 11. We now know that grave sins were being practiced in seminaries and rectories and convents. But the laity were also guilty of much sin. Who was out dancing in miniskirts in 1961? Only non-Catholics? Who was already welcoming new forms of contraception and were so addicted to the practice that there would be loud rebellion in 1968 when the Pope tried to reinforce the Church's position on the sanctity of human life? Only non-Catholics? These evils were not the fruit of the council, and they were not even seeds planted during the council. Rather, they were deep-rooted weeds that were not being pulled up by the pastors long before the council started. And in due time, their sheer density and volume would threaten the good wheat. I want to throw in something about the Garabondo being an icon of the church. Um, sometimes prophets are called to act out their message. We can think of Ezekiel being told to dig a hole in the wall and pass with, put, put baggage over his shoulders and walk through the wall and out into the desert. He was acting out the exile of Jerusalem that was to come into, um, across the desert to Babylon. So I think um, the, the Garabando whole event was an acting out of the council with all it went through. Now, I would like to point out the context of the Marian movement messages given through Father Gobi. Very often, Father Gobi received a message during Mass after the Gospel. 
Father Gobi was a very simple priest who lived a public life. Humanly speaking, he had neither the time nor the intellect to invent the messages, and there were no mentors slipping him texts during Mass. So it is significant that Mary made no difficulty about delivering the messages during con-celebrated liturgies, which were a novelty after Vatican II. For example, in message 387, I accept with joy the act of consecration to my Immaculate Heart, which you are receiving each day during the con-celebration of Holy Mass. I am obtaining for you in superabundance the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is communicated to you by the Father and the Son through the powerful intercession of your Heavenly Mother. Message 861, how much comfort you give to my sorrowful heart when in your gatherings, coming together for con-celebration, you renew all together the act of consecration to my heart. And message 408, how pleasing to me is the prayer of the Liturgy of the Hours, the entire rosary which you recite, the Eucharistic adoration, and the solemn con-celebration of Mass, which forms the heart of the entire cynical. Note, they were celebrating Mass and the Divine Office in the vernacular, according to post-Vatican II liturgies, and she says that she is pleased. Moreover, she was fine with con-celebration. She wasn't asking the priest to please separate and find individual altars. Now we move over to Mejigori, where a papal envoy has been recently sent to reside there to assure the pilgrims that the messages are important and worthy of meditation. At Mejigori, Our Lady has emphasized attendance at Mass at least 47 times. Indirectly, this, approves, this alludes to an approval of Vatican II, because on October 6, 1981, she specifically expressed her desire that an evening celebration of the Mass be part of the itinerary of the pilgrim's schedule. The Last Supper was an evening Mass, but gradually laws about fasting before Mass became so rigorous that people wanted the Mass to be celebrated as early as possible in the day. With the easing of the fasting laws and a variety of mass times, attendance became more feasible for the working class. Our Lady encouraged devout and frequent attendance. October 8, 1984, she said, I would like to guide you spiritually, but I would not know how to help you if you are not open. It suffices for you to think, for example, where you were with your thoughts yesterday during mass. When you go to Mass, your trip from home to church should be a time of preparation for Mass. You should also receive Holy Communion with an open and pure heart, with purity of heart, with openness. Do not leave the church without an appropriate act of thanksgiving. I can help you only if you are accessible to my suggestions. I cannot help you if you are not open. And so now we come to the promised Amsterdam messages. The fourth message, August 29, 1945. That's almost 20 years before the Vatican II. So Ida Pudeman, this humble factory worker, says, I see lines of young priests passing by. The lady says, a lot has to be changed in the church. The formation of priests will have to be changed. A more modern formation, suited to the times, yet good, in the good spirit. The lady says that latter part with emphasis. And I add, and we know that the spirit, not the documents of Vatican II, turned out to be a bad spirit. Ida goes on, I suddenly see a, do a dove flying around my hand. It is being held captive, yet it is flying around continuously. The dove is sending forth new rays. The lady then points to the pope and says, and this, I don't know about the translation of the Dutch grammar sometimes, Breath, that, that is expansion, has to come more social. Various movements are tending towards socialism, which is good, but can be done under the guidance of the church. The lady now looks very dejected and says, very much has to be changed in the formation. Ida says, I see great countercurrents, much opposition to this in the church. Skipping to the 27th message, February 11, 1951. I am bringing you here, says the lady, and suddenly I am with her above Italy. I see the Vatican, and then I enter St. Peter's together with the lady. We walk through the central passage and halt near the middle of St. Peter's. 
On either side, I see scaffolding, benches mounting up in tiers. Upon those benches, I see many cardinals and bishops wearing white mitres. Now, note, nothing is like that in modern times except Vatican II. The lady says, watch closely. These are the bishops of all countries. Now I see the pope seated. The lady says, listen carefully, child. Changes have already been made, and others are in progress. I, however, want to bring the son's message. The doctrine is right, but the laws can and must be changed. Note, when she says in 1951 that laws were already being changed, this is correct. For example, they were already moving the not time of the Easter vigil from Holy Saturday morning to Holy Saturday evening as a nighttime celebration, which had been the custom for centuries until the laws about fasting from midnight were introduced. So these discussions, to look back to the, to the models of the early church and compare it to the present times, was going on a long time before Vatican II in preparation for what ended up being the council. I quote again from the message of the same day. Then the lady folds her hands. I now see the pope with cardinals and bishops. Then the lady says, as if speaking to the pope, you can save this world. I have said more than once, Rome has its chance. Seize the present moment. No church in the world is built up like yours, but move with the times and insist upon your modern changes concerning religious, priests, seminaries, and so on and so forth. Keep an eye on that. Carry through with it to the smallest detail. The doctrine remains, but the laws can be changed. Then the lady says to me, I showed you in the dream how the practice of frequent communion can be carried through. This I tell you for the Netherlands, and for all countries in which it is not yet so. The 37th message, November 15, 1951. Christian people, know your duty. And now I am speaking to the Church of Rome. And so I say to the Pope, see to it that your subjects know how to bring the love of the Son, Jesus Christ, into this degenerate world. The Church of Rome must fulfill this commandment to the utmost. And then I say, be broad-minded. Try to place yourself in this modern world which Jesus, with Jesus Christ on the cross. Try to understand these words well and to carry them out. This world can only be saved by the church which abides by this doctrine. Then she refers to Paul VI as a fighter pope. Recall at La Salette she had urged Christians, fight children of the light. Prayers alone and complaining and the wringing of hands annoys the mother of God. She wants action. Quote, and now, once again, I am speaking to the Pope, and I say, you are the fighter. You are the savior for this world. You will be taken up among us. This Pope will be revered by the peoples of the entire world. Now, who was this fighter Pope? Mary shows Ida in 1945 but she wouldn't know his name until she saw him on television. The fourth message, August 29, 1945, Ida said, I feel a deep sadness arising. The lady smiles and says, but joy will follow. At that moment, I can also feel that joy. I see rays, bright rays. Next, I see large buildings, churches. Churches of all sorts appears. That is not only Catholic churches. The lady says, it must become one large community. At these words, I feel terrible pain in my hands. Storms are coming upon these churches. Now the lady lets me see three popes. To the left, above, stands Pope Pius X. He's in heaven. Standing in the middle is our pope, Pius XII. And to the right, I see a new pope. Pointing at the three popes, the lady says, these three, that is one era. This pope, pointing to Pius XII, and the new one are the fighters. Almost 20 years later, in 1963, when Cardinal Montini was elected as Pope Paul VI, and Ida saw him on television, she immediately recognized that the third fighter pope was Paul VI. The 39th message, February 17, 1952. Mary said, the church is and will remain the Lord and Creator desires gratitude from the creature. 
The church is the community of peoples who shall adore and honor the Lord and Creator, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All those who have been placed over the community shall see to it that the church remains and expands. This time is our time. The Lord and Creator deems it necessary to give the church a warning through the Lady of all nations. The time has come. Tell this to the theologians. The church, Rome, is now getting its chance. All Christians of this time are responsible for their descendants. Tell the Pope it is all right. By the will of her Lord and Master, the Lady of all nations will assist him. The Pope will carry everything through. This Pope is the fighter and the Holy Father of the Christians of today and the future. Nations hereafter will revere him. He will be taken up among us. The church is and she shall remain. Doctrine is and it shall remain. The form and laws, however, can be changed through the intercession of the Holy Spirit. Tell this to your theologians. The church, Rome, shall devote its attention to the peoples of this world. The sheep must be gathered into one fold. The Christian people, each of you personally, take the cross in hand. As the lady says this, it is as if she picks up that cross and lets it be seen. With that cross in your hand, you will possess the kingdom. With that cross in your hand, you will encounter your neighbor. With that cross in your hand, you will vanquish your foe. Thus shall the Christian people of this world feel themselves one with the church and the cross. The memorial of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the Mass, has to be brought among the peoples more. Bishops, you can see to this. You can have the sacrifice celebrated in a more communal way. Understand these words well. Another allusion to con celebration. 40th message, March 19, 1952. I am sitting before the painting of Our Lady, praying for the Pope. Suddenly a voice starts speaking, and I see the Lady of all nations standing before me. She is very serious and says, The church, Rome, will face a great struggle. Before the year 2000 arrives, much will have been changed within the church, the community. The essence, however, will remain. Then I see, so to speak, the sheep running confusedly all over the globe. Many are fleeing. It is as if the flock is splitting up. The lady points at it and says, do you see that? The church, the sheep have been scattered and still more will take to flight. The lady of all nations, however, will bring them back into one fold. Tell the Pope that he is the fighter, the pioneer for this new time. Ida says, it is, if, it is as if I again see a hall in the Vatican. Many clerics are together there with all sorts of papers before them. Then I suddenly see the Holy Father again, alone. He too has many papers before him. The lady says, tell the Pope that the Lord and the lady will assist him in this difficult and burdensome task that he should prepare and carry out everything for the coming times. He knows what I mean. The lady says this with very special intonation, as if speaking about the future. She goes on, this time is our time. A burdensome task is resting upon his shoulders. He shall check whether everything which he says and wants of the community, the church, is being carried through. Note, I would just point out to you the magnificent encyclicals of Pius XII, who set the stage for the Council. The 43rd message, October 5th, 1952. Be apostles among one another, for you are all one. Each of you must see to being an apostle. Be of one mind among one another. How can the community, the church, be large and one if you are divided among one another? Be warned and try to be honest and good to one another. No, the lady is not reproaching you, but she has come as a good mother to warn the apostles of the church about false prophets, among, about the wrong spirit. Everyone pray the prayer which I have given. The lady of all nations has been sent specifically in this time in order to conquer spiritual decline, degeneration. You who are in spiritual need, Come to the Lady of all nations, and she will help. Next, I tell the apostles of this time, be broad-minded, be mild, be good to people, condemn and judge justly as the Lord Jesus Christ did. Understand your time. Understand the fight. 
be aware that the spirit is fighting. This is the time of the spirit. The fight is hard and difficult, but the true spirit will triumph, provided that all of you cooperate. Church of Rome, seize your opportunity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit now wants to make this church large. Understand your doctrine well. It is necessary for the lady, lady to come and say all of this. Remember the first and greatest commandment, love. That embraces everything. And again, the lady pauses without saying anything while gazing into the distance. Then she says, the Pope of Rome has the most burdensome task of all those who went before him. As she says this, I see many, many popes of former times with all kinds of head coverings, large miters, small miters, and caps. The lady says, people, help the Holy Father. Act according to his example. Follow the encyclicals. Let the world be filled by them. And then the spirit of untruth, lies, and deceit will have no chance. And Ida sees the word encyclicals written in large letters above the pope. Heavy pressure is hanging over the world. Your enemy is lying in wait. Church of Rome, seize your opportunity. And now I'll close with the ominous 46th message, May 10th, 1953. The false spirit is ruling the world. Modern paganism, humanism, atheism, modern socialism, and communism are ruling the world. Beware of the false prophets. The lady of all nations cannot repeat this enough, nor warn of it sufficiently. People, listen, it is the same Lord who is sending me to warn you, the same Lord, who has once, once sacrificed for this modern humanity as well. You do not know what great powers are threatening this world. And now I am speaking not only of modern humanism, atheism, modern socialism, and communism. There, there are yet quite different powers threatening this world. What are those different powers? May Jesus and Mary be loved by all hearts.